Good morning, Central. It's good to see everybody. Hey, it's that time of year where we celebrate the freedom that we have as a country. And this morning, I'm, a, I'm also thankful even more for the freedom that is found through a relationship with Jesus. So I want to invite you to stand now as we begin our time of worship together this morning. everyone. We're so thankful you're here this morning. And if you're new with us, welcome to Central. Can you believe it? It's July and it feels like summer is in full swing now. And I'm sure your summer will be filled with cookouts, vacations, running through the sprinkler in your front yard. But as we navigate through this season, let's be mindful to seek opportunities to have maximum impact for Jesus. 
We are just one week away from our kids and teenagers heading off to camp. And our kids are heading to Maryland and our teens are heading to North Carolina. We are so excited to see how God works in their lives as we set aside distractions for the week and completely focus on God. We thank God for this opportunity to go, but we also want to thank you. Yes, you. Do you remember back in February when we started our envelope fundraiser for camp? Well, thanks to your generosity, we were able to fully pay for all the camp participants that were signed up at that time. Together, we raised $6,700 to invest in the lives of kids and teenagers. This is an incredible blessing. God is so good. Thank you so much for investing in our kids and teenagers. And thank you also for investing financially in Central. The easiest ways to give to Central is online at our main website, discovercentral.org. You can also put cash or checks in the drop boxes by the Worship Center doors. Like we said before, summer can be busy. Be sure to always stay in the loop for everything going on in the life and ministry of Central. You can do that by sending us a communication card, and there are two ways you can do that. Electronically from discovercentral.info or with one of the paper communication cards right in the pew back right in front of you. And you can drop those in the drop boxes by the Worship Center doors. And if you share an email address with us, we'll send you our weekly update. Now, let's sing about how great our Lord is. All right, you can go ahead and stand as we continue to worship together this morning.
Thank you this morning for this time of worship. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do for us. We thank you that you are the cornerstone, the sure foundation that we can place our hope and build our faith upon. Lord, we do look forward to the day when you do return to gather your children to be with you forever and we get to sing your praises in your presence for endless days. But God, until that day comes, I pray that you will encourage us, strengthen us, and give us boldness as we take the good news of the gospel to the rest of the world. God, I pray now that as we open your word, that you will open our hearts and minds to receive it. And I pray that you will allow it to impact us so that we can impact others for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, life is full of questions, isn't it? Questions about life, questions about God, big questions, humorous questions, but life is full of questions. It doesn't just start as you get older. Even kids are full of questions. Sometimes they ask the most questions, right? I was reading this week about questions that elementary school students had about God. Uh, I thought you might enjoy them. Jennifer wrote this. She said, in Bible times, did people really talk that fancy? Robert asked this, hey, dear God, I'm an American. What are you? Jane asked, God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you already have? Norma asked, hey, dear God, did you mean for giraffes to look that way or was it just an accident? Nan wrote, God, how do you love everyone in the whole world? There's only four people in my family and I can never do it. Joyce wrote, Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but why didn't you give me a puppy like I asked? And Elliot wrote this, God, where do babies come from? I hope you'll answer me because I think about you sometimes, even when I'm not praying. You know, when I read Elliot's question that he wrote to God, it got me thinking, I wonder if Elliot's parents realize that he has moments in his life, unguarded moments, not just like when he's going to bed at night or not just at the meal table, but unguarded moments in life where he's questioning about God, he's thinking about God and wondering what he's like and who he is and things like that. And who's going to be the one who shapes Elliot's thinking about God? And you know what? Everyone thinks about God. Everyone has questions about God. Every person who's ever lived has these questions. One of the ways we know this, you go to any civilization, any culture on the face of the earth that's ever existed, and you see that the human heart is made to worship, right? If they don't know who God is, what do they do? Well, they carve a pole. They, they take gold and they fashion into an idol. They look up to the skies and they start to worship the, the sun, the moon, the stars. There's something in creation, in humanity that says we've, we we're made to worship. There's got to be a God. And if, well, if I can't figure out who God is, what generally happens? Well, then you think yourself, that you're God, and you begin to worship yourself, and it all becomes about you. But there's something in humanity that tells us we're made to worship. So we have these questions about who God is and what he's like. And sometimes we think that if you have questions about God and you can't really get them all answered, well, then it's almost like paralyzing. Well, if, if I don't know the answers, I, I don't know. I just, uh, what, what do I do from here? I just kind of paralyze. I, I, I want to take you to an important section of Scripture this morning. It, it deals with the life of Paul. It's during a time when he's got some questions. We're going to see how he's acting in light of those questions. How do we live life between the questions and the answers? Because we know some answers, we don't know them all. How do we live life in between the questions and the answers? Let's check it out. Acts 17, 16 through 34. Acts 17, 16 through 34. Luke writes, Now, when Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. 
Some of them were Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. He also conversed with them. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life uh, man, life to all mankind and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. In all of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So, to give you a little context here, uh, Paul was on his second missionary journey at this time, okay? So he'd already been on one, he's on his second one, and he had just been run out of Thessalonica. A really difficult time in Thessalonica. He'd only been there three weeks, and then there was like this mob that formed, and there was a riot that was breaking out. They went into Jason's house, is who Paul was staying with. They drug him out into the city square, and some other believers too, trying to figure out what was going on with Paul. Paul had to just escape and run away for his life. So, it was a really, really hard thing that he had just come out of. And so as he's coming out of that, his friends are probably thinking, Paul, you probably could use a little R&R, you know, a little rest, relaxation. Why don't you stay in Athens for a few days? We'll meet, you, uh, we'll meet with you there. And one of the things we understand as we go to 1 Thessalonians and you begin to read 1 Thessalonians, when Paul is run out of Thessalonica, he's full of questions. He's full of questions about the church. What happened to the church in Thessalonica when he was forced to leave? Because he was only able to stay there three weeks. And so Paul, his practice is he would, he would stay in a place and he would just put the scripture into them and make sure that it was like in every fabric of who they were. And then he would, he would develop leaders and equip elders to lead the church. He didn't have time to do any of that in Thessalonica. He was forced to leave. And so in 1 Thessalonians, he's writing and he's saying, you know, I was so grateful and so thankful that Timothy was able to send word and let me know that, well, things in Thessalonica are going well. That the church didn't only survive, but the church is thriving there. And so he's so grateful. Why? Because in the meantime, when he first gets to Athens, he's full of all these questions. What, what happened to the church? Was it worth it to really go there? What, what's going to become of this place? And so he's full of all this. And so you're wondering, okay, now what is Paul going to do? How are you going to act when he has all these questions about the place that he was just run out of? Well, as you go through the book of Acts, by the time you reach Acts 17, the second missionary journey, you kind of have an idea, well, that's not going to slow Paul down. I mean, he's still going to have conversations about Jesus. And so this is what happens, right? He's walking around and the, the spirit is just moved within him, is provoked as he's seeing the people and their, their idolatry and their idol worship. And he longs for them to know the one true God. And so his spirit's just moved within him. And he's having conversations with them. And, he, you know, at Paul's practice, first he'd go into the synagogue and he'd talk to the religious people. 
Usually an argument would break out, something like that, and then you'd go into the marketplace, and Paul's in the marketplace, he's just talking to the people there. And in, in Athens, it happens to be Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. By the way, did you know that Stoic philosophy and Stoic religion is, is making a comeback in America right now? I was just seeing this week about, hey, Stoic philosophy says this. It's, it's really making a comeback. Now, uh, and they're actually billing it as a new thing. Listen, it, it was like dead and buried in a closet somewhere, and people have dug it up, and now they're saying it's new. But at the heart of Stoic philosophy, it basically says this, live life based on reason, not by emotion. And so when you look at our culture right now, and so much of our culture is just based on emotion, well then this type of thinking, it's really attractive to some people who are, you know, I'm just kind of anti-conformist or something, I want something different. Okay, And so Stoic philosophy and the writings of Seneca are being pulled out and spread. Seneca, he wrote things like this, that we should live modestly, that we should learn from our challenges, that we shouldn't be too ambitious, that we should keep calm, that this is how you live life as a Stoic. Uh, Now, Paul, as he's having these conversations, he's having conversations about how do you live life? Because the people of the day are wondering, do we live life based on emotion or do we live life based on reason? It's really interesting, isn't it? That if you listen to what people are saying today, they're really asking the same questions. That all these years later, humanity really hasn't changed. We're still asking the question, do we live life based on reason or do we live life based on emotion? They're asking the same questions. And Paul is jumping in and he's basically saying, you can live life based on reason. You can live life based on emotion. But if you live life without God, you've missed it all. That a relationship with God informs how you live life. That emotion's not bad when it's filtered through a relationship with God. Reason's not bad when it's filtered through a relationship with God. But it's all about the relationship. And so these are the questions that he's dealing with. This is what he's answering. But are you catching this? Paul had questions too. It's not like Paul had all his questions answered. He doesn't know what's going on in Thessalonica. He's got all kinds of questions about that, what's happening. You, you can imagine the turmoil that he's, that he's living with because he, he wanted to see this church flourish and prosper, and he's wondering if he even survived after the mob that he had to escape from. But here he is in Athens, and he's walking around, and he sees this temple with, or, or this altar with an inscription to an unknown God, and he uses that to really have a conversation with the Athenian people. Now, before we get to the conversation that he had and how he shared the gospel and like learning from that interaction, I want to come down just for a moment, just on a base level here, because you know at Central all the time we talk about discipleship and the importance of like really living our lives on mission and investing in the lives of others, uh, and sometimes we hear uh, you know that and we wonder, well, you know, I don't know if I know what to say. I don't know if I have all the answers. I don't know if I can really, you know, make disciples or, you know, whatever the case. I don't want to be awkward. And so all of that stuff, that's basically circumstantial, situational. And we've got tools for all that. We've got tools for, you know, what to say, how to start, for what to do when you don't have the answers. We've got tools. There are resources available to you for all those things. Here's what's really hard to give you that we can't just give you, and that is excitement about Jesus. You know, we can't just like give you a relationship and say, okay, be really excited about Jesus now. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Okay? Now, when Steph and I got married, she knew that I was a New York Yankee fan. Okay? She knew I liked the Yankees. In fact, when Pierce was born, she knew that I was going like, to dress him up like, in Yankee gear. Right, and we're going to be all excited. And I was going to take a picture and send it to my friend, who's a Red Sox fan. I mean, she knew that was going to happen, okay? Because she knows me. But here's the thing: what she doesn't know, what she just didn't get, is like, hey, this is the best game ever, and oh man, that was the worst game ever, and the highs and lows of the season. Like, she doesn't get it, right? It doesn't matter how much I try to explain to her about the Yankee mystique. You know, she'd be like, what Yankee mystique? And I'm like, yeah. They've won 27 championships, 27 World Series. No other team has won half that much. You know, I'm trying to like, but it doesn't matter because she'll walk into a room and be like, okay, who's playing? And I'll tell her, and she's like, okay, so are the Yankees wearing pinstripes or red? And I'm like, oh, no, no, this is bad, right? But here's the thing. She doesn't have the passion for the team. 
She doesn't have the relationship with the team. She hasn't been through the highs and the lows. She doesn't have the memory of all that. And so she lacks the relationship. If you don't have the relationship, if you don't have the excitement for Jesus, well, you're never really going to talk about him. The questions don't really even matter all that much because there's no relationship. Paul has questions. Yes, he's full of questions. And not just about the Thessalonians. Right? He, he wrote uh, to the Corinthians. And he said, hey, now we see through a mirror dimly. Now I know in part. I don't, I don't know at all. But I know one day, just as I'm fully known, I'll fully know. But hey, in this life, hey, there's still questions. But here's another thing that Paul realizes. That he has answers that the Athenians don't have. That they're out there looking and they're talking uh, Stoic philosophy, Epicurean philosophy, emotion, reason, all these things. They've got all these questions. He realizes, hey, i got questions too, but i got more answers than they do. And so he has conversations. Why does he have conversations? Because he has enthusiasm. He just has excitement for his relationship with Jesus. And, and that's the first thing. How do you live between the questions and the answers? Well, you have excitement for your relationship with Jesus. You have enthusiasm for your relationship with Jesus. How do you know if you have excitement? Well, one way to kind of get an idea is if someone were to ask you, hey, uh, what has Jesus done for you? If, if you got to like think back to like when you were a kid or a teenager or something, um, it might be an indication, right? If you, if you don't have something from this last week, really, where you can say, oh man, I was reading in the scripture and it was just like God gave me that I just so needed to, that. Or, you know, I was walking and, and I saw this person and I just really felt like provoked with him. I need to have this conversation. Or, you know, really, I, I just, I knew I needed to call my friend and, and just like pray for them. And, you know, if, if you don't have some stories you can just look at and think, man, here's what God's doing in my life now. Here's what's making me excited about my relationship with Jesus now. If it's all the way back like years and years and years ago, it's an indication of an absence of relationship, right? Because you wouldn't do that with any other relationship in life. Right? It's just, well, I don't have to go all the way back then because I talked to them the other week. Um, so it's all relationship. By the way, Christianity is not simply a system of beliefs. It is that, right? We do have our beliefs, but those beliefs all come out of who Jesus is, who God is, who God is and what he's done. That informs how we ought to believe. And so if you don't have a relationship with him, you lack the excitement. When you have a relationship with Jesus, that produces excitement. How do we know that? Well, you know it just based on your own life and people who know Jesus, but you can also just let me read through the Gospels. We read through the Gospel of Mark this last year, studied through that. What do we notice throughout the Gospel of Mark? The people could not get enough of Jesus, right? They were excited about him. And so they're coming from wherever it is, their towns and villages, and they're going out in the middle of remote, uh, into remote places just to hear Jesus teach, to get more of what he's saying. And when they leave, do they leave with all the answers? No. They still got questions. But what are they doing? They're telling everybody they can find about who Jesus is and what he's done and what they've learned and how they've changed. Because they can't get enough of it. That's what relationship does. It's, it's excitement. And then what happens? Well, you start having conversations because you talk about what you're excited about. And so here's Paul. He's having conversations. He, he, and, and how does he have these conversations? Well, he starts by finding some common ground. Paul says, hey, I was walking around and I couldn't help but notice y'all are a very religious bunch. You know, you got some deep thinkers out here. And hey, and here's this altar that you have with this inscription to an unknown God. And hey, let me reference your poets over here. And so he's, he's just, what's he doing with all that? He's building common ground, just saying stuff that they can relate to. And by the way, how, how do you relate to people? Well, look at Paul. He's a Christian Jew who's relating to pagan Gentiles, right? On the face of it, you're wondering, well, do they really have that much in common? Well, you can always find something in common. It doesn't matter what it is, right? It can be uh, sports, airplanes, uh, you know, where you live, what you do, whatever the case, what you've read, whatever the case may be. You can find some kind of common ground, and that's what Paul's doing. He's finding common ground with people. And he said, oh, man, yeah, Seneca said this. Well, let me tell you something. He's part right, you know? It, it's, he's not right just be, you know, it's not good because Seneca said it. 
what he says is sometimes good because that's how God created the world. And so Paul, he's leading it all to who Jesus is. Um, you know, I remember being in high school and uh, being taught um, Gestapo evangelism. You know, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's where you kind of go and you, and you knock on a door, you know, you bang on a door, and then you have this like rehearsed speech and you ask a couple questions. And uh, it's awkward, really. You know, it's painful almost. And it, it, maybe it worked back then, I don't know, but it doesn't work today. One of the reasons why it doesn't work today is because, well, we're a skeptical bunch, okay? We, we see all over the place people trying to manipulate what we think and people trying to scam us. And are they trying to sell us something? Like, what is all this about? Right? We're a very skeptical bunch. And so, you know what we trust? Relationship. You trust relationship. Where, hey, I know, th- I know they're speaking the truth to me because they've demonstrated their love for me. Because they know me. They know who I am. They, you know, they've, they've, they'll speak hard truth to me. They don't just tell me what, I'm, what I want to hear and pat me on the back. And by the way, that's what Jesus did, you know? He was very personal in his interactions with people. He never had this rehearsed speech that he just went and, okay, it's the same delivery to every last person he meets. No, it's always unique to everyone he meets because he's personal. How, how do you get personal? Relationship, right? It's, it's hard to really be personal with someone if there's not a relationship. And watch this. When it gets personal, when you have a relationship and you start having these conversations, you as the one who's initiating the conversation, do you still have questions? Yes. You still have questions about life. You still have questions about God. It's not like he's answered every last question that you have. You still have them. But as you're having the conversation and as you're developing uh, the, the relationship, guess what? Those questions aren't necessarily top of mind. The relationship is top of mind. And let, let me show you how this works a little bit. Uh, parents and grandparents, they have like this superpower where they can get just about any conversation to their kids or grandkids, you know? It just happens. It doesn't matter. You can be talking about whatever. It can be weather, politics, you know, what you ate for dinner last night. And, and somehow they can turn the conversation to their kids and grandkids. Why? Because there's excitement there. There's relationship there. They love them. So, hey, you know, we ate you know, spaghetti and meatballs last night. Really? Oh, look at this picture, you know, from a couple weeks ago. You know, it, it just happens. Uh, do they know every last thing about their kids and grandkids? No? No? Do they have questions? Yeah, I'm sure they have questions. Like, I wonder where they are right now. I wonder what they're doing right now. I wonder what they would think about this. You still have questions. But those questions don't paralyze you and say, you know what? Since I have those questions, I'm just going to pull back and not invest in that relationship anymore. No, no, no. Quite the contrary. The questions actually push you and propel you forward to want to know more and to invest in the relationship more. You understand, it is the exact same way with Jesus. That when you have a relationship with him, questions don't paralyze you and say, you know what, I better not talk about Jesus until I have every last question answered about him. That, you would never do that with any other relationship. And listen, as you go through the scriptures, nobody does that with him either. Right? It propels people who have relationships, it propels forward. And then what do you do? Well, you move the story to Jesus. You actually begin to talk about him. You start conversations, you build common ground, and then you move the story to Jesus. You move to the story of Jesus. And why do you do that? Because here is the big question that was being asked really in Paul's day, and it's the same big question that's being asked today. And it is a question of identity. Who am I? That's what our culture wants to know. I mean, you see it everywhere. Who am I? Who who am I supposed to be? How how, how am I defined? The only one who can define you is the one who made you. Jesus is the only one with that answer. Who God is, what he's done, tells you who you are and what you then are to do. And if you don't get that, you will never understand who you are. And so you find common ground, you build relationships, you move to the story of Jesus because only he can answer the big questions of life. And so, and as you do that, guess what? Don't be afraid of the gospel. 
Don't be afraid of the gospel. I, Paul said, hey, I'm not afraid of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. I can't, I'm not going to be afraid of that. Now, the gospel doesn't make sense to a lot of people. It's offensive to a lot of people. But that didn't slow Paul down. It actually didn't stop anybody down who really has a relationship with Jesus. Why? You want to bring him into the conversation. You want to talk about him. Now, Paul faced all kinds of things because of the gospel. He was run out of Thessalonica. He faced much worse in other cities. Um, you know, Jesus actually told uh, a parable about a sower with uh, the seed. You remember this? And so the seed represents the gospel. The sower represents Jesus and how he's just scattering the seeds of the gospel on these four different types of soils. You understand, of those four different types of soils, only one soil was good. Okay, The other three soils were not good. But it's not like Jesus said, you know what? Three out of the four, bad. So I'm just going to be really careful, and I just want to be like as sure as I can be that when I scatter the gospel, when I start talking about the gospel, that it's going to be on some good soil. Because, you know, I don't want to feel bad if this doesn't go well. That's silly, right? Jesus, he throws the seed of the gospel everywhere, right? It just, it doesn't matter. It's just, hey, this is what you need to know because he's the only one who can answer the questions that you have in life. So just liberally sharing the good news of the gospel. Um, and yeah, it's not always going to go well. It's not always going to be received well, but that doesn't matter. And another thing is sometimes it just takes time. You know, we, we talk about the discipleship process and these discipleship um, questions and conversations. And by the way, evangelism is the first part of discipleship, by the way. It's not like, okay, now they're saved. I'm done. I've done my job. No, no. Evangelism is part of discipleship. It's the first part of discipleship, sharing the good news of Jesus. But then after that, you know, the rest of the Great Commission, then we, hey, we teach them to obey everything that he's commanded. So it, it, it's a continued process. But even the evangelism part of discipleship, uh, it's, it's not always a conversation that's done in minutes, you know. Sometimes it's weeks. Sometimes it's months. Sometimes it's years. And you just take the conversation as far as it can go in the moment. We like to tell the stories about, you know, you have a conversation and right on the spot, uh, they, they repent and they believe. And that's exciting. But we tend to tell those stories because they're so rare. Most conversations, most people, it just takes time. And I was thinking to my friend Scott in Troy, Montana. Uh, we were having conversations with him for three years before he repented and believed. Right? But three years of just like investing and building the relationship and talking with him. And, and during that three years, what did Scott see? Well, he saw the love of the church. He saw the love of people just coming alongside of him and serving with him. And, and he knew that he was being prayed for. And he saw the impact that we were having in the community. And then after three years, you know what? I've never met people like you in my life. There has to be something about this Jesus that you keep on telling me about. And, and then he repents and believes. But it, the greatest testimony that we have as a believer is our love for one another, okay? Jesus said, by your love for one another, this they'll know, okay, that you're mine. Love takes relationship. It's hard to love outside the context of relationship, and that just takes time. And by the way, Jesus, when he talks about this, he often uses agricultural illustrations, right? You plant, you wait. You water, you wait. You weed, you wait. And then, and then there's a harvest, you know, and sometimes, hey, you get to plant. Sometimes hey, you, you get to kind of nurture it. You get to kind of water it a little bit. And sometimes you get to harvest. Sometimes you're part of a conversation and you get to do all three. But the point is, it can take time. And it often takes time. But you take the conversation as far as you can, and then you're able to pick it up the next time. And as you pick it up the next time, you're able to, hey, here, here's what Jesus has been showing me. Lately, here's what I've been learning. Here's how I've been changed. Here's what's happening in my life. And if someone were to ask you, well, what's been happening in your life? What changes has Jesus brought about? What have you, what have you learned? How have you grown? Like, what would you be able to say? You know, would you have something to say? The great thing about Christianity is we actually believe that our teacher is alive. 
we actually believe that his Bible, the scripture, is living and active, and that it equips us for every good work that he's called us to do. And so if someone were to ask you, you know, what, what are you learning about God, about Jesus, about his word, about who you are and how, you, how you're to live, do you have something to say? Um, I really hope that you're learners, right? I, I hope that you read. Uh, you know, I, I'm reading right now a book called um, Letter to the American Church. It's a good book. But at no time does, like, other books ever replace the need of the believer to be in the Scripture and to be learning from God and His Word. Okay? At, at no time does any other book ever replace that. We all need a diet of God's Word where we can point and we can say, yeah, here's, here's what I've been learning. Here's what I read this last week. Here's how it's impacted my life. Yeah, can I tell you what I've been reading this last week? What I've been studying? So, this fall, we're jumping into First and Second Peter, Okay? You know, our normal thing here is just to go verse by verse through the scriptures to really understand what God says in context and how we're to live. At times like this, we do some topical series to address some other issues. But uh, we're getting back into First and Second Peter this fall and really diving in there. So I've been reading and just studying a little bit of First and Second Peter, getting uh, prepared for that. And I was just reading First Peter this week. Uh, this thing hit me. It was, it was incredible. I don't think I've ever noticed it before. But First um, Peter chapter 5 uh, Peter sends greetings from the church in Babylon. Now, that's interesting because Babylon had been defeated by the Medo-Persians like a long time before Peter wrote 1 Peter. Okay, so why is he talking about Babylon? Well, he's using the name Babylon as a stand-in for Rome because in Babylon, Babylon was characterized by idolatry and immorality. And at the time, Rome was characterized by idolatry and immorality. But then it gets even a little more interesting, because if you fast forward further to Revelation chapter 16, you see a woman in Revelation chapter 16 who's from Babylon. Okay, that Babylon is kind of a mystery place. We don't know exactly what that Babylon, where that place is. But here's what you see. It's another place that's characterized by idolatry and immorality. And so as you look at this and you're just reading this, you kind of get the big picture of this. What you see is humanity apart from Jesus, we long to worship something, right? We have these questions about God and who he is and what he's like, what he's like, and we long to worship something. And so, when, you're, when you long to worship something, you will create things to worship or you will worship the cre- creation rather than the creator if you do not know who the creator is. And so before Christ, what happened? Idolatry and immorality. Right at the birth of the church, what happens? Idolatry and immorality. At the end of time, what happens? Idolatry and immorality. What's interesting about this, during our first gathering, one of the teenagers, she came up and she said to me, Steve, as I was looking at this, you know, the last verse there that we read from Acts 17, there was uh, one of the believers, one of the converts was named Dionysus. Now Dionysus was a Greek god. You You understand this? One of the converts was named after a Greek god, the god of um, pleasure, I think. Anyway, you can check me on that one. But, uh, it, but, he, but he's named after this god. So probably had parents who, hey, we, we know there's got to be a god out there. We have some questions. We don't know who that is. But hey, we're going to worship somebody. Maybe this will honor the gods. And so we're going to name you Dionysus. And then what happens? Well, he's introduced to the one true god, Jesus Christ. Listen, if we're not out there sharing with people, building relationships, and sharing with people the good news of Jesus Christ, we just leave them with their questions. And they end up with some really, really futile answers. So how do we live between the questions and the answers? Well, first, we have excitement and enthusiasm for our relationship with Jesus. Next, we start conversations. We build relationships with people. And then we move those conversations to the story of Jesus and his gospel. And then the questions that we have, 
They don't neutralize you. They don't paralyze you. Quite the opposite. They, they actually thrust you forward into deeper relationship with Jesus to learn more about him and to discover more and more about who he is and what he's done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are a good God. You have not hidden yourself, but you have revealed yourself to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, and we thank you for his death, burial, and resurrection because that answers the biggest question in life. It answers who we are. It answers what we're to do. It answers how we can be uh, restored to a proper relationship with you. And so, God, in a culture that is asking these questions about who am I, God, I thank you that you have called us at this time to live in this generation. What an exciting time to be alive. May we be a people who share the good news of your gospel um, because we know the answer and the change that is brought about in us. We recognize we need your help to do that, so we ask this by the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.